Hello, today we're going to be covering 8.4 human impacts on wetlands and mangroves. Before we get there, we're going to review section 4.6 watersheds. 4.6 basically is describing the characteristics of a watershed. And all the land that drains, a watershed is all the land that uh, drains into a specific body of, body of water. For example, the LA River versus the San Gabriel River. Both of those have specific areas that drain into them. It's determined by sloped ridges of land divide the watersheds and different runoff directions. For example, here we have the slope coming down. We've got this watershed. All of these water comes into this particular watershed. Now, vegetation and soil composition play a role in how the watersheds drain. The slope, the um, more vegetation, more infiltration and ground recharge. If there's a greater slope, there's going to be less uh, infiltration, but faster velocity, more runoff, and more soil erosion. The soil permeability, meaning what kind of soil it is, is going to determine the infiltration rates. So in the city, there's going to be less infiltration. Human activities in a watershed impact water quality. For example, clear cutting. If we remove the trees, it's going to go faster. If we have uh, impermeable surfaces because of urbanization. If we have dams going, or mining, it's going to definitely cause differences in the uh, type of watershed that's going to happen. Now, one of the uh, ones that you definitely need to know about is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Here, Chesapeake Bay has six states, everything from New York, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, West Wisconsin, Delaware, all draining into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, it's a mix of fresh water and salt water and nutrients in the sediment. The, the make the, the make the estuary habitats like salt marshes in that bay highly, highly productive. One of the most highly productive uh, biomes on the planet. So you can see here all the grasses there. Estuaries and wetlands provide ecosystem services, for example, tourism for hotels, restaurants, and permits to go swimming or fishing. Uh, water infiltration, it, the uh, grass roots on the edges of the uh, watershed trap pollutants. Habitats for food sources, fish, crabs, um, shellfish. Storm protection, they buffer storms from causing problems along the seashore. So you can see the crabs and the fun happening along the seashore. Human impacts in Chesapeake Bay. Nutrient pollution, the nitrogen and phosphorus, leads to eutrophication of the bay. So algae blooms are due to the increase in nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, the algae bloom decreases sunlight so that the plants below the surface die. Therefore, the bacteria break down the plants and use up the dissolved oxygen for decomposition. This leads to hypoxia or low oxygen levels. And since there's not enough oxygen, the fish die. That's why it's known as a dead zone. And so what happens here is major nitrogen and phosphorus sources. One is discharges from water or sewage treatment plants go into the bay. Also, we have water coming from major farms or from homes where you put, uh, the, here it's natural or uh, the fertilizer being put on by the farmer, or when we put it on our yards. Both of those, if there's rain, it's going to wash off into the uh, watershed. Other major pollutants would be like endocrine disruptors, which we talked about uh, earlier. Sediment, which causes turbidity. Sediment is how cloudy, it, turbidity is how cloudy it is. It's caused by too much sediment which is caused by deforestation, urbanization, agricultural fields. It increases turbidity, which reduces sun, uh, photosynthesis, and it covers the sediment, uh, turbidity, the, the sediment covers the stream beds, which means that they won't be able to pull in light. You can see here the huge amount of turbidity going into the first the lake and then into the estuary and what's going to happen to the fish when there's or the plants when there's too much uh, sediment blocking the light
Direct effects of clear cutting, for example, soil erosion caused by loss of stability um, of the root structure. It removes organic material and nutrients from the forest, deposits its sediments in local streams, and warms water, makes it more turbid. So you remove all these trees, and it's going to be going down into the water because it's not going to slow it down. You can definitely see this is not clear water. Increased soil and stream temperature. Why? Because there's not as much tree shading, which increases the soil temperature. Also, soil has a lower albedo than the trees. More light is reflected here than here. Loss of tree shading along rivers and streams warms them. The erosion of sediments into the river also warms it because of the increased turbidity. Some of the solutions to it, we can have uh, and manure management where it goes into a pond, but then we can take that and put it directly onto the crops, use it. Or some farmers are taking this manure and making it into methane, which they use to produce electricity. Uh, you can also have cover crops, which will decrease the albedo effect increase the albedo and less uh, warming of the soil. Uh, you, we can also have improved the septic tanks so that there's not as much water going into the streams. We can improve the wastewater or water treatment plants. So practice FRQ for 4.6 would be, deforestation can affect water quality. Identify one change that can occur in the water quality of streams within a watershed that has been deforested. And two, explain how deforestation can lead to this change. Now, 8.4, what are some of the human impacts on wetlands and mangroves? So we're going to be looking at the describing the impacts of human activities of wetlands, the suggested skills, being able to describe the potential responses or approaches to environmental problems. So wetlands, again, is an area with a submerged, saturated water for at least part of the year, but shallow enough for emergent plants. So you can see here the cattails. They have roots here, but they can go up above because it's shallow. The wetland plants have adapted with roots submerged in standing water, but either uh, part of the plant going up above or below the surface, being able to get plenty of sunlight. Some of the ecosystem services of wetlands would include providing for habitat for animals and plants, regulating uh, groundwater recharge, increasing the amount of water going down so that we can drink it, uh, absorption of flood water, CO2 sequestration because of all the plant life that's there, so it's supporting uh, ecosystem service for water filtration, pollinator uh, habitats, nutrient cycling, pest control. A cultural ecosystem service would be tourism revenue, fishing licenses, camping fees, educational and medical research in that area. Some of the threat to pre uh, wetlands would be pollutants, such as the nitrogen, phosphorus, nutrients, sediment, motor oil, pesticides. Now the motor oil, every time you go out driving, there's going to be oil leaking from your uh, car. And whenever there's a rain, that's going to go down into the wetlands. Development wetlands can be filled in or drained to be developed into homes, parking lots, stores, agricultural land. Water diversion products uh, for flood control, agriculture, drinking water, um, dams, such as at the Everglades where historically we had all that area. Now it's dried up because of the, the dam construction for flood control or hydroelectricity. This reduces water as sediment flowing into the wetlands and basically wiped out the, most of the Everglades. Overfishing disrupts the food web of wetlands. It decreases the fish predators and increases the prey. Solutions, we've gone through this, where we take manage the manure, have ground cover, basically improve the septic tanks, and either the sewage or the water treatment plants. Some of the benefits of, of uh, uh, and threats to mangrove, some of the ecosystem services would be wood, 
livelihood, people living in uh, around mangroves, 120 million people live around them. Ecosystem services of up to $800 billion a year of the ecosystem services. Climate regulation, pulling in CO2, mangrove is able to take in three to five times as much CO2 as a tropical forest. Coast protection, it protects from uh, tides, from floods, five times more cost, uh, cost effective than great infrastructure. Water infiltration, so that the water goes down into the groundwater. Tourism, fun to go out there. And lots and lots of fish and crabs and clams. Some of the threats would be logging, getting rid of the mangroves, uh, agriculture, converting it to agriculture, aquaculture, half of mangroves are lost globally, pollution, which will um, either sediments, solid waste, or oil, coastal development, building buildings or parking structures, climate change, where it's getting wa uh, warmer and warmer, uh, it's changing the acidity, a mangrove uh, basically just cutting them down. There's four times as much um, uh, loss there than global. Almost 150,000 basketball courts lost annually from the mangrove forests. So practice FRQ 8.4. Can you describe how one specific human activity can lead to increased phosphorus levels in an estuary ecosystem? And two, can you describe one step that could be taken to reduce the phosphorus input from the activities you described above? Hopefully that was helpful, and thank you very much.